forward them the URL that you used today to log in and they shouldn't have any problems registering. Um, this livecast is actually on YouTube right now live. So you can go to the Brand Innovators YouTube page and you can uh, share that link with all of those same folks that couldn't tune in and register earlier. So um, the last thing I wanna do before I bring on our awesome guest MC today is uh, thank Cisco. Cisco is our official technology partner here at Brand Innovators. Um, they have been powering our live casts for the past couple of months and we're just so glad that they're a part of our community. So speaking of the community, I'm super excited because today's guest MC is a personal friend and partner of Brand Innovators. Um, his name is Casey Saran. He is the co-founder and CEO of SpaceStack, um, which is the first platform to bridge the gap between social media and paid media. Um, Casey has uh, been a very, very busy man um, over the past six weeks. How you doing, Case? Hey, Lauren. Hey. How are you? I'm doing well. Very excited to be here. Um, yeah, and it's, it has been a really busy uh, six weeks. The the Facebook boycott and um, obviously uh, everything impacted by COVID. Uh, plus, now we got a storm going on. It's it's been been crazy, but. Uh, for me, it's just so cool to see the brand innovators community thriving and, and pushing forward um, with, with everything going on. So very happy to be here today. Awesome. Yeah. Well, like I said, and, and you said, you know, you've been really crazy busy at, at, at Spaceback. So, um, you know, extra special thanks for joining us today and taking a couple hours out of your day to, to host. We appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm very excited to be here. Um, so yeah, to tell everyone a little bit about who I am, uh, I'm Casey Saren. I am the founder and CEO of a company called Spaceback. Uh, and what we do is we convert social media posts and, and recreate them uh, inside display banner uh, placements. So uh, really as standard ads. Um, and really the, the, the history is that we've just seen that brands are creating such amazing content in social. And, and it's really because uh, the innovation in in social and the user experience is, is pushing forward, we think a lot more quickly than, than ad experiences. So I've been in the programmatic space for over 10 years and, and worked a lot as, um, I ran product at a company called Rubicon Project, uh, worked at AdMeld and Google a couple of times and, and just seeing the technology innovation uh, in, in ad tech um, is, is progressing at a you know, crazy pace. Uh, however, the user experience has, hasn't changed that much throughout my career. Um, the, the boxes that we're actually putting, uh, putting in front of people at the end of the day are, are pretty similar to what they were uh, 10 years ago. Um, even though the pipes have become so much more sophisticated and measurement and targeting capabilities. Uh, so when we started Spaceback, we were just looking at this dichotomy of, of um, great experiences on, on social and then kind of afterthoughts uh, in, in ad spaces and thinking that uh, there's a big opportunity to to create, uh, recreate the social experiences and ad units. Um, drives a lot better performance for brands. But uh, I'm I'm especially excited to be here because what we're seeing is that D to C brands are actually really leading the way in in terms of content. And and we're seeing we we work with a lot of uh, larger brands uh, that are, have been around for a long time that certainly you would not call a, a traditional D to C brand, but they're actually making a, a lot of efforts to look more like D to C. Um, so really the the thought leadership and innovation i think is happening here um with, you know with with this group and this community and, and this is really what uh even some of the largest brands are are looking to um when they're thinking about how to how to engage with users and how they want to manage brand identity and social and across uh, other environments through paid um so without further ado I'm, I'm looking forward to learning a lot from our speakers today too uh, i'd like to introduce rob gregory from jelly smack and Emily Culp from Cover FX Skincare. And a uh, special shout out to Emily too. I'm sure she can share more, but um, she gets the uh, Trooper of the Year Award uh, 100% for, uh, she, she was impacted by the storm and, and does not have uh, Wi-Fi or, or power even. So I actually have no clue how Emily was able to make this happen. I'm sure she can tell us, but thank you so much for making it, Emily and, and Rob. Um, so I'll let you guys take it away. And we may have a, a little snafu. I don't. I don't see uh, Rob or Emily uh, on my screen yet. Here. Can you hear us now? Oh, I can hear you. Great. Oh, okay. I was Casey. You can hear me, right? This is Emily. 
Yep, I can hear you. How's it going, Emily? Oh, it was uh, superb. Thank you for the shout out. I will say I look like a crazy person as I drove a few miles away from my house and found a nice little hot spot in front of someone else's house. So, yes, if you hear ambient noise, that's what's going on in my life. That is amazing. Hopefully they don't come out and uh, and chase you off their Wi-Fi. But so glad you're able to. <laughs> you know what? I'll just. I'm just going to incorporate them into it. If they're great questions, why not ask for some random person's input as well? There we go. Yeah, invite them into the community. I like that. Cool. And do we have do so we Rob, have Gregory as well? Yes. Hi, Casey. It's Rob. Can you hear me? Can hear you. Absolutely. Fantastic. Great. Well, Rob, I'll let you uh, introduce yourself uh, and Emily, and then uh, and then segue into the the session there. Terrific. Thank Hi, you. Emily. Hi again. How are you? So good. So let's jump right in. I'm Rob Gregory. I am uh, President of Sales and Marketing of Jelly Smack. And today's session is brought to you by Jelly Smack. And here's our two minute public service announcement. A Jelly Smack is a school of jellyfish. So the name of our company is a metaphor for uh, communities. In our case, communities that form uh, on social media and move together in um, in predictable patterns. Um, and that's our company's mission is to build and maintain these um, communities across a variety of verticals. That's our reason for being. And our secret sauce behind the scene is that we have original technology that identifies, that breaks down and identifies the patterns that these um, communities form when they're um, when they're consuming content on social media. Um, one of our biggest categories is beauty. Some of you may know us from some of our beauty channels like Beauty Hacks, um, Beauty Studio, and Beauty Wow. And our offering to brands is a is a one-two punch. We we work with performance-oriented brands. We offer the authority that comes from being introduced to a natural community of, of, in this case, beauty enthusiasts. Um, and then we use tech to target the followers who are most likely to engage with content and most likely to buy. So that's Jelly Smack. And I'd love to, to start, Emily, with, with you talking a little bit about your journey, the journey that led to Cover FX. I know you've, you've worked for some iconic and amazing companies um, like Estee Lauder and Keds, to name two, super cool brands. So if you could maybe, you. Um, you know, get, give us a little bit of your um, background and, and what, what led you to your current position as CEO of um, Cover FX Skincare. Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, the quick synopsis on me, I actually started my career about 10, the first 10 years I spent on the agency side. And I feel very fortunate for doing that because it really enabled me to learn every single channel from the ground up, whether it was print, TV, digital marketing. And just to date myself, this was when you could get a 99% click-through rate on a banner. And I actually explained to a client why I was so sorry I lost the 1%. Um, so that should be a little humbling for some people. Um, so anyway, where the agency part was phenomenal was it really taught me how to balance both the art and the science of overall 360 marketing, really from every single perspective. feel very fortunate to work at amazing companies like Digitas, went through uh, going public with them all the way to the end of my jaunt in the agency world at Ogilvy working on iconic branding campaigns such as even Kodak, which was really a lot of fun. And then fast forwarding, as you mentioned, Rob, i um, been fortunate enough to be in pioneering roles, both at Estee Lauder specifically working on Clinique, which is one of my favorite brands of all times, um, specifically around their positioning around being allergy tested and fragrance free and really one of the first derm brands out there um, that was accessible for a lot of different people. So worked there and then also went into fashion at Rebecca Minkoff and then uh, up until recently was at Keds, uh, CMO there and launched them into their centennial. And the thread leading up to cover effects is 
I am brought in to transform brands, um, really looking very closely at how to drive exponential business growth, upwards of 30% CAGR growth year over year, and think about how to dynamically reposition brands, look at their entire um, channel mix as it pertains to geo, but also points of distribution, and then position them to win with phenomenal teams. So couldn't have done any of this without amazing people working with me, achieve great success. And now I am at Cover Effects which I adore. It is a vegan, cruelty-free brand that stands for inclusivity as it pertains to not only ethnicity, but also age and skin type. And so we are a brand that really celebrates each individual person and creates a high-performance, clean product that they can customize for themselves. Terrific. So that's my quick snapshot, but I'm happy to dive into anything that sounds interesting. Terrific. Well, you know, I, before we get into um, skincare and D 2 C and the the world of social platforms and um, channel mixes and 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 all all of these things, I'd love to pick up on the conversation we had earlier about, um, you know, how we how you and all of us are managing this new normal, right? Right. We've had the 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 storm in the Northeast that knocked out your video and and a lot of the power for people all around yeah, both yeah. of us is just the latest example of 2020 being the year that keeps giving um and now we're we're you know we're also in the middle of a um of a ve very very hard to predict uh and very uneven uh you know return to to uh commerce and business and you know um working in offices and uh, all, all of these things. So can you, um, you know, you have a lot of people who report to you and, and, a, and a big job. Can you talk a little bit about how you've been navigating your way through this and, and maybe share some, some best practices and some, you know, some ways um, you and your team have, have rolled with the punches, so to speak? Sure, I definitely can. Um, it is, you know, there's so many different things that come to mind. I think you know, we were having a great conversation for anyone uh, tuning in now. Rob and I were catching up before this. You know, there's amazing things that you can do on technology. You name Zoom, BlueJeans, we can all do a thousand different virtual things. But there's something to be said about what I consider spontaneous interaction, meaning when you finish a meeting in person, then you have a great idea before another meeting or you want to catch up with another coworker that maybe you didn't feel comfortable in that particular meeting or it hadn't dawned on you, but you have something you want to share and you grab a coffee. That is something you can't replicate easily in this all virtual world right now. So some of the ways I'm trying to, and I admit I have not fully mastered this, I do not think I'm alone on uh, struggling to figure out how to do whiteboard sessions and have them be inspiring still and have the energy be pervasive or the spontaneous interactions. Some of the things I try and think about is, you know, ensuring whether it's through town halls, it's communicating with your teams and the whole company for that matter. Maybe, you know, in the past, you hadn't had the opportunity to talk to everybody um, as much as COVID has enabled, but it's really making sure everyone in the company understands, you know, what is strategically going on with the business. Where do we fall in the continuum of purpose? I really think purpose is a key part of strategy right now. And when you think about what's motivating people, when they're at home, why are they getting out of bed with the 6,000 things they have personally and professionally going on? Purpose is key to propelling that energy and unlocking it. Um, other things that I've found helpful, it just off the top of my head, I'm an optimist realist. I, as much as humanly possible, try and work with people to think about, you know, get a little space, take a little vacation, like a day off, from every single device in your house, spend it outdoors or what, whatever you like doing with your plants, animals, or children, and get some perspective because there is a horizon. And as you, Rob, astutely mentioned already, between COVID, huge social movements that have been going on, storms taking out power, it's daunting. 
So how do you keep morale up and how do you keep an open dialogue and keep people feeling nurtured and heard? So those are some, of, I mean, it's really basic. It's over communicating, whether it's through emails, town halls, it's reminding people what is the horizon? What are we focused on? What are we excited by? And then the other piece I touch on too is celebrate the wins. I right. mean, getting a product out in this day and age, I mean, especially for us, we just launched uh, two huge products. What we have to go through from a supply chain perspective, componentry in China, formulas in Italy, different parts in the U.S. that are getting hit with COVID, none of us, any of us could have anticipated. So getting it out and in the consumer's hand is so well worth the celebration. So I think that's also key. I think, you know, that's that's awesome, Emily. I think that's a consistent thread that I've seen and heard from a lot of people, too, is that um, companies and teams are kind of surprising themselves with what they're able to do in this environment. And, and you know, things like product launches or pivots, um, which we did in our company, and um, and other things that you 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 know seem very daunting and and impossible to do virtually, and they're and they're actually they're actually happening. Um, you know, our company we we we've hired about forty people since the pandemic started, and we've been onboarding them through Slack, which is a, which is a really interesting right, process right. because you you know you can't physically meet everybody. So, but you want to get their vibe, and you want to get a sense for their personality, and you want them to your to your point to be you know, motivated and excited and feel like they're joining a community and a team. So we've kind of learned how to get people to share their, um, you know, favorite pop culture pursuits and, you know, personal things about them. Um, and they do it in such incredibly creative ways that in some ways, I think we get to know our new people faster and better than we would if they were suddenly working across the hall from us in, you know, in, in an office. I think. I I think that's totally true. I think one of the other two things, just on different parts of the business spectrum too, that I should have touched on is roles and responsibility. I think in particular in COVID times, because there are things that none of us realized were critical jobs because pre-COVID needs to do certain things didn't exist. For example, uh, you know, procuring your own PPE equipment. We, you know, one of our key um, distribution partners is Ulta. I can't say I thought that was a skill set I was going to round out. Um, it is. So I think, and also making sure that you're clarifying within your team who's doing what. So even with the best intentions, people are um, allocating their resources or time the best in the best manner. So I think that's also really key, talking about accountability and responsibility as those continue to flux in this world right now. And then the last thing, just as a business leader that does keep me up at night, and I think anyone heading a company is making sure you have liquidity. Understanding that none of us know exactly what is going to unfold. I think good things are happening. I'm positive we'll find the vaccine, but you need to make sure that you have a strong handle, especially if you're privately held on your 13 week cash flow and understanding exactly where your business stands. Right. And do you, you know, you mentioned, you used the word optimism or optimistic before. Yeah. Do, 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 do you think there are, um, there are things we're learning and practices we're developing that will, that will translate well into the, into the post-pandemic world, whatever that looks like? I do. I, do. I mean, one of the things that I've been really passionate about um, in general, especially for people recently graduating, whether it's from undergraduate or the graduate world, is it's very hard to teach people how to come up with creative solutions with ambiguous data or input. And I would say one of the best things that um, COVID is helping to refine in many people at different phases in their career is you will never have perfect data or input. It's not humanly possible because we don't know what states or different countries are going to do from a policy perspective, right. but it's with the limited data that you have, at which point can you articulate or create two to three viable solutions, share with your team, refine them, and then, you know, as I like to say, embrace smart risk. There's, there's no perfect answer but you have to have the conviction to move forward 
and to find a solution because not acting is worse than making a bad choice in my mind. Right. But that's a skill set. I'm excited. And that's not taught in business school or undergraduate in yeah. case study methodology, et cetera. Yeah. Some things you can't you can't learn in business school. That's that's for sure. Um, so let's let's get a little closer to the world of um, of direct to consumer marketing and to and to cover FX and so sure. and maybe maybe talk a little bit about how you're thinking about your the tools at your disposal and your changing media mix. Right? We we we've seen obviously we've seen a lot of things that were happening organically and naturally. Um, have been sped up. You know, there's the, the that concept yeah. of the the five year rule transformations that <laughs> probably would have taken roughly five years are now are happening. Um, you know, right away this year be, be, because of yeah, COVID. Yeah. Um, there's a huge burst of activity in e-commerce, social commerce, time spent online, time spent on social media platforms. All of these things, the um, the transformation and other media category seems to be also sped up um, and it's in the news almost every week. I, I think Hearst announced last week they're not publishing uh, Oprah's magazine in print anymore, right? Again, not a Which surprise. Which I was shocked by. by yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, I spent I spent 25 years in the print world and I'm uh, I, nothing shocks me at this point. <laughs> um, I understand, but I will say there were a few, I mean, especially with titles disappearing, like sand at this point, but that one surprised me. But yes, yeah, please keep going. Yeah, and so if you're you're a marketer and you're you're trying to reach consumers, you're trying to reach consumers of of skincare products. Um, you know, you're right. trying to reach a, a how do you do it? A, a, a broad range of people. It's you know, how do you do out of home when nobody's walking through Times Square? How do you do print when nobody's reading magazines? How do you rethink your digital strategy when seventy percent of millennials have ad blockers installed? And you know, also, how do you think about um, the noise level on social feeds now? There's, there, you know, the the um, the shopping experience on Instagram. Just to use one example, yep. um, you know, it's just hyper sped. We we got a we got a new puppy during quarantine, and the internet figured oh, out. You got a pandemic puppy. We did. We got a pandemic puppy. His name is Louie. And the internet figured out immediately that we had a puppy, and I had no idea how many D 2 C dog care, dog training, dog food, dog products there are a lot. Uh, that yes. were you know flowing just on Instagram alone. It's absolutely ph phenomenal. You know, it's almost like the paradox of choice. You have so many companies and products that are getting better and better at targeting you. Um, you know, it's it's um, it's a challenge. Anyway, so can you get super broad yeah. setup there? But if you if you want to want to talk about the, the the changing media mix and what you see, you know, working for you guys and what's what's speeding up and sure. you know what's what's working. Yeah, I mean, I think there are a few things. I always start. I bring it back to where is our consumer? He or she spending time. So if we start with that truth or insight, then we can figure out where to allocate our time. Um, and money and also, you know, creative resources. So one of the areas we know, as you mentioned, you know, is social media. Huge opportunity for us. We have on Instagram over 1.2 million followers. We've also dabbled with TikTok recently, which by the way, is, we all know, uh, strangely addictive. Um, some channels, as you mentioned before, some in social, such as Instagram, we participated in the beta for shopping, are interesting to see how consumers will convert there. But we're not actually in Instagram to convert to commerce, per se. It's more actually to have a direct dialogue with our consumer. The most important thing to us around Instagram is sharing educational content, how to use our products, and actually getting insight and feedback from our consumers it actually informs your product pipeline. So to me, a key way we engage with our consumers is social media. Another way um, that we do leverage the digital channels is our email database. Those are, as you know, people who have opted in, who are interested in your brand, who've raised their hand. That also gives us a great opportunity, whether it's in advance um, product releases or sharing more in depth video content, et cetera. That's another way we can communicate with the consumer. 
Um, I'm going to go old school for a minute. I think um, if any of us are being honest right now, depending on where you were, especially in the U.S., the amount that um, the Postal Service, UPS, or FedEx is driving around um, many of our neighborhoods or cities is mind-blowing. So for us, a key opportunity is actually sampling. So right. whether it's sampling in our own CoverFX.com, of course, and, you know, you purchase from us, but also, as I said, one of our key partners is also Ulta and Amazon. So there's opportunities for us to sample with consumers to try our products. And we know most people are at home, not everyone. And I want to be very clear, very grateful for all the necessary workers and medical, et cetera. But many people are home. So we know there's an opportunity for trial there that we're really excited by. Um, and then finally, we do know people are, as you said, maybe not picking up print, um, no disrespect to print as much, um, but they are on blogs, whether it's Refinery29, the real, uh, you know, the Zoe report or something like that. So we know it also makes sense for us to have a rapport with not only influencers, but also editors. So as you right. know how that works, it's us sending them products. There's no payment whatsoever, except for, I guess you could consider sending products, but we don't know what the review will be or if they review us. And we've found that to be very effective as well too. Right, right. So, um, so, so many questions. Well, first, let, let's talk about TikTok sure. a little bit more, the strangely addictive, wonderfully yes. controversial in the news TikTok. Um, oh, indeed. What, yes. what do you think's going to happen? Is Microsoft going to buy them? Are they um, yes. becoming more a part of your um, thinking and your, your marketing mix? And, you know, t t t tell, us, tell us more about your TikTok opinion. Yeah, TikTok for us, well, first answering, uh, I admit I have not read the news this morning since I have no access to it, but I do believe there will be some type of deal struck between the president of Microsoft or CEO of Microsoft and the president of the country on TikTok. I do think that will go through. Um, and I actually think in many ways it would be healthy for Microsoft to be back into the mix and possibly change up the dynamics between uh, some of the monopolistic players in social media right now. Right. So I'm in favor of that. Um, in terms of TikTok for us, you know, our consumer is not as is not quite probably the demographic of TikTok, but we have a few consumers on there. So that's because she, why she's, you know she's we, not that young. She, um, it's probably not that young exactly. But we had some of our consumers share with us on Instagram, "Hey, you should check out TikTok." Again, going back to where it's an amazing lab. We're like, why not? If you're suggesting it, you're there. Let's launch TikTok. So it is not going to be our primary focal point in any way, shape, or form, but we know some of our consumers are there, and we want to make sure that we're engaging with them. And yep. it's one of those things that, you know, we'll closely monitor, similar to many other social media platforms as they've ebbed and flowed over time. Yep, yeah. Yeah, so many fascinating things about TikTok, like the, 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 um, the speed at which consumers and brands are, are learning the, the, um, and, cre and creators on the platform it's so are, dynamic it's right. so fun yeah. what, what, what happening i mean we we, we launched who say my previous company which in the influencer marketing space in 2010 and so we had we you know it's pre-instagram and we had a we had a front yeah. row to see how, you know how long it took to learn each new platform and to you know yep. wrap and practices rate. and get it into a groove and with with TikTok, it's happening at lightning speed and oh, it's um, amazing yeah, yeah, and they, I, I love their, 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 you know, rolling out their business platform and their, their slogan is don't make ads, make TikToks, which. Um, well, you know, I, I think that's what's refreshing. And I have to say, I think we're from a cultural perspective right now where everyone loves it. For the most part, it's a happy place. Yeah. People are not going there espousing political or personal views. It's a few yeah. nanoseconds of something usually pretty amusing. Yeah. Um, and if it's not amusing, it's only nanoseconds of engagement, but it's like a happy little utopia right now. Yeah. I hope it stays that way. Yeah, it, it, it really is a comedy platform in, in many ways. Indeed. Um, that, but that's that, why it's, I think that's why at this particular cultural moment, people are seeking, I just want five minutes of happiness or entertainment. Right, right. right. Um, so let's talk, you mentioned m monopolistic um, uh, Large social platforms. Yeah. 
Um, let's talk about Facebook for 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 a minute. The the um, sure. you know, obviously Facebook has been in the news uh, in many ways in the last couple of years. Indeed, uh, privacy yep. issues, content issues, um, and the you know the boycott this year. Data, uh, it, it's you know, data. It's, yes, many and, different things. Yes, and and we know at Jelly Smack from you know working with a lot of D2C brands. Um, Facebook is huge, you know, it's a, it's a, it's incredibly it important to a lot of brands and a lot of marketers and it's, you know, it's the, one of the most powerful things on the planet. So can, can you talk a little bit more about, about how you're thinking about Facebook these days? Yeah, it's, for me, it's quite a conundrum. And what I mean by that is going back to thinking about all the different media channels that any brand has in their arsenal one of the most important ones is you're looking for reach. And in the day that might have been print or TV, I would say at this point it is probably not as much, although reach is pretty phenomenal on top shows, et cetera. Um, I, you know, the reach on Facebook and the digital platforms is pretty unrivaled, so that makes it very, very attractive for most of us. I think where the conundrum part comes for me is, and I would say putting on my consumer hat, is there have been a number of different choices the platform has made um, as it pertains to PII compliance um, and data that can definitely impact our country and individuals that is not, doesn't feel terribly responsible and maybe not something as a brand that you want to endorse and continue to help thrive and grow. Um, so that's where, you know, we did join the boycott uh, in July, and we're trying to navigate a very challenging situation like many other brands. Yep. Yep. Um, so any other thoughts on, um, platforms that, that you've, you've begun to look into outside of, you know, if we'd say the big, big five or six is, you know, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, um, TikTok, YouTube, um, yeah. Other platforms you know, that work I mean, you guys, like Pinterest or Reddit or um, the podcast space? Yeah, our consumer, frankly, Pinterest is fascinating, has the utmost respect for that platform. That's just not um, typically where our consumer spends a ton of time or they don't for beauty. It's right. more, it's high sensorial. You want to see an application. It's not so much like a mood board. So I wouldn't say that platform is optimal for us. Um, you know, it's, it's the, the other platforms that are off the charts right now, whether it's WhatsApp to LinkedIn, again, we know there are a lot of consumers thinking about where are our consumers. It just doesn't lend itself to engaging with our brand as much. So that's right. why we are very heavily focused on Instagram. And as I said, you know, we're active in Facebook. We have a pro community there that we launched a few weeks ago that's really active and fun. Um, but we're focused on the big ones right now. And, yep. you know, always keeping our eye open on other ones as well. Yep. So um, can we drill down a little bit on on uh, influencer marketing and, and, sure. and, and creator course. marketing? and? And how, how, yeah. how you view that space, you know, I, I, I know from personal experience, it, it, it seems like um, the 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 influencer marketing um, space is counted out on a regular basis and people are usually wrong. Um, it, you know, those articles start appearing in the early days when there were a few um, FTC compliance violations and some brands got in trouble. Yeah, yeah. It, you know, in part, probably yep. just just ignorance of how, you know, how to how to use the platform and how to comply with these emerging FTC regulations. Then you had these cultural moments like the Fire Festival, where another batch of articles came yes. out and said influencer marketing has jumped the shark. Um, it happened a little bit at the beginning of the pandemic when some some of the some of the influencers and creators um like something navy posted stuff that yep. was was tone deaf about you know we're all in this together if you're you know if your description of being in this is having a house in the hamptons you can go off to with your you know your nanny and your maid and that was you know that caused a whole um relatability crisis for you know for for her so um it, it, you know 
if if influence or maybe I'll use a sports metaphor if if influencer marketing and all its promise uh, was a baseball game, what inning do you think it would be in? Ooh, all right, I'm not going to lie. Baseball is not my sport, but I'm going to go with this question. I do understand baseball. There are nine I, innings in I a baseball. I know what you're saying. <laughs> right. I know that. Okay. My son does play. I'm just by like the sixth inning. I'm like, are we wrapping up? Can we call a rain situation yet? Right. Um, so <laughs> We're in the yeah, seventh inning of stretch of influencer market. <laughs> yeah, like let's just end this thing. That's why right. I like that he's picked lacrosse now. I won't lie. Right. Um, in terms of baseball, Hmm. I'm not sure. Let me tell you my thoughts. I feel like we're at the eighth inning, but the question is, what does the win or the loss look like? For ah. me, why I answered it that way is because I think that's really, you know, important to give context around my answer is right. I really do what you said before in something Navy and many other what I would consider mega influencers, like at the macro level with millions of followers. Mm -hmm. I do think, and I've sensed this for about the past two plus years, but I think COVID has without question accelerated it, that mega influencer who every two seconds is oscillating between the hair product, the yogurt, the vitamin they took, the chew toy their dog used, or the diaper that their daughter is crawling perfectly by in a manicured lawn in the background, every part of their ethos has been, it feels like almost sold. And none of it feels remotely authentic because there's no DNA or strand to these brands. It's just, you get a sense whoever paid the most, they will uh, be the face of that brand for that moment. I yep. think people are really exhausted by that. So to me, what I'm excited about is I feel like the idea of let's not just pay for someone who has 30 million Instagram influencers. One could argue, does any one of those followers even care who this person is, except for they feel socially they should follow them. We're going right. back to like nano or micro influencers. I mean, that's what we're doing as a brand more so. And what I'm excited about is, you know, whether it's me, my head of content or my head of social, we personally know these people. We right. actually know what their skin is. We know, as a matter of fact, when we just launched this pre and probiotic limited tinted moisturizer, we know which ones of them are going to be over the moon to try it. No pressure for them to do any content around it, but we're excited to work with them and share it with them because they're friends of the brand and ours. And you, to me, you, that's far more fulfilling than dealing with 50 agents and shipping a product and someone saying, you know, I like this product. It's amazing. Try it. Right, but there's no right. passion, and there are challenges with micro influencers, right? You you need you need to oh, sort there's of challenges with everything. Some, you need, right? Yeah, can be. Yeah, it can I mean be the like challenges. Cats. Yeah, to your point, I'm sorry to interject. I get so passionate on this. The challenges with micro, you know, is going back to what we talked about before: is reach. You right. know, you need a number of them. I think the part to me that I've been focused on is I look at their engagement. So maybe their reach isn't as high as a macro, but guess what? They have a heavily um, high engagement rate, which frankly is far more valuable to me and the brand. Do you put any parameters on the definition of a micro influencer or a nano influencer, like in terms of a minimum number of followers, or do you just look at the authenticity of their, of their content and the, and the level of fan engagement? Um, to your point, it's a little bit of art and science for us. We sure. tend to, yes, I do have new, uh, metrics usually where they tend to, there's patterns, you know, after X number of followers, people start to cross into a different level of engagement, how they want to work with brands. And yep. unfortunately, a lot of times, not always, but a lot of times that also does correlate to authenticity. Right, right. So, I mean, I do, one thing I do want to clarify, we do work with some great macro ones, but frankly, most of those macro ones we started with when they were micro, we right. have a rapport with them and we're so excited that they continue to grow and thrive. And of course we'll keep working with them, but we don't usually start with them at that point. Got it. So can we shift a little bit to um, sure. cover FX and the, and the clean beauty yeah. product space and, and, and talk about that. Um, what, what are, um, so super exciting space, right? But both 
there there are I think so. <laughs> there are large mainstream brands that are um you know have have known for quite some time that um you know safe ingredients, natural ingredients, um a purpose-driven approach um to to this category is becoming more and more meaningful to to consumers and consumers are are smarter and more knowledgeable and leaning into that more and obviously an explosion of of new brands and you know indie beauty brands and and uh and so forth so when when you're when you're talking i guess we'd start by i'd start by asking you when when you're talking to this customer in particular to whom these things are important um what are what are the the cardinal cardinal rules of um you know of credibility and and authenticity i mean i think it's like it, we're so fortunate our consumer genuinely cares about clean beauty now where i want to pause is i feel like saying the word clean beauty right now is similar to saying organic food like 15 years ago if you can remember that when nobody knew what that you meant you meant. use good pesticides bad pesticides yeah. but everyone all of a sudden became organic but they're different shades of that yeah. i think one of the most important things for us going back to clean beauty and how we use it is being really transparent with our consumers because there is no universal standard in the u.s right now that's right. why even if you go to one partner shop at one store to another one and i mean huge retailers they have different definitions because it's not being governed so what we can do for the consumer is be super honest with them and that's why on our website we say you know here's what ingredients as i mentioned before we have a ton of scientific ingredients that are really good for you around the microbiome around really fabulous naturally um, sourced ingredients we also purposely make sure by the way there are a lot of great natural ingredients that you don't want in your skincare products for example poison ivy is a natural ingredient you don't want that in your beauty product um, so we explain to the consumer on our site and on our packaging what we don't have as much as we, what we do have. And I think that's really important. So we empower them to make the choices that are important to them. I'm just wondering if there's a poison ivy opportunity for some, some for you I'm, know, I'm personally audience. Am going to avoid, <laughs> yes, no, indeed not. Like it's like there's nothing that could be positive out of that. But my point in bringing up that really crazy example is a lot of times people think if it's natural ingredients, it must be good for you. That correlation, right. similar to cinnamon, is a natural ingredient. It's also a very known irritant. Right. So that's where we need to make sure our consumer, and especially so many of them at this point have, a lot of people have sensitive skin. In fact, 90% of consumers identify that they have sensitive skin. And there are a lot of people right now who have allergies. So that's why we make sure that we're really clear with what we do have and what we don't have in our products. Yeah, so, so much more of a, an approach of individuality and, and seeing, seeing each, each consumer for who she is and her, her unique preferences and needs and, and technology to enable it. I think, I see Casey on the screen. I think we are ready to wrap up, is that? Yeah, we have yeah, into time. Um, yeah, Emily, I know you can't see me, but I am. I am back. Um, yeah, we're and we're we're, we're wrapped. I'm so sorry, Casey. <laughs> you could no, try and find me if you want, or jump out of a tree, and I would see you that way. <laughs> oh, I. <laughs> uh, well, thank thank you so much for. That's for, a visual for everyone. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm actually on the tree uh, in the tree above you right now. You can't look up. <laughs> That's spectacular. And I, the, by the way, that would round out my day. I would love it. <laughs> right. Um, hey, Emily, one, one thing uh, that that you said that I think it just just summarizes. Uh, I mean, we talk about this with our team a lot. Uh, not acting, being worse than than not doing anything at all. Um, I think is just like a, a huge takeaway um, from from what we've been going through this this year and really pretty much translates to, to all industries. Um, but uh, it's totally a time where, you know, we've seen some partners have, you know, a lot more inaction and not know what to do and, and really limits learnings. And right, right now is a time for accelerated learnings and, and an opportunity where, you know, no one's executing exactly according to plan. So as those plans are changing, um, get, getting out and doing stuff. So it's really cool to hear that you're, that that's how you're leading. And, um, and I, I did want to ask Rob one question before we move on. Uh, I, I just couldn't let this go. Uh, what kind of puppy did you get? 
Dachshund, male Dachshund named Louie. I was nice. going to go with a doodle. <laughs> I was going to guess a doodle something. Yeah, Rob, you do seem like a doodle kind of guy, but. Yeah, well, thank you. Best thing we could have done, by the way. He just, he kept, kept us all sane the last four months and uh, amused and distracted when we needed it most. That's amazing. Well, again, I'm, I'm glad uh, you acted um, in, in that case too. And, and uh, we actually got it, got a, a pandemic puppy as well. Um, so maybe one. Ooh, what'd you get, Casey? We got a mutt. Um, she was actually, uh, she was bought by UC Davis. She was a frat dog for a week um, and the frat decided they were not equipped to have a puppy. Um, so gave gave her to a shelter where we got her. Fantastic. I love it. I'm trying to get a shelter dog. I have two thirds of my family on board. I have one more third this way. Nice. Hopefully, hopefully you do, Emily. And then uh, maybe one of these days when uh, post vaccine, uh, me, you, and Rob can get our dogs together. Maybe probably dogs, not puppies. But puppy party. Puppy party. <laughs> Excellent. Dogs play day for sure. Emily, Emily and Rob and Rob, I know we'll be hearing from from you more a little bit later as well. Um, but for uh, for our next session, uh, I want to introduce Mark Schlosser from White Ops and John Sheldon from Smile Direct Club. Um, so if we can go ahead and, and bring those guys on, um, Mark uh, has been at um, working at working at White Ops, uh, and you know it's a company that I have a, a lot of respect for, shining a light on. Uh, some of the some of the bad players and and really looking out for for healthy value exchange and for the whole ecosystem. Um, so, Mark, I'll, I'll invite you to introduce yourself and, and introduce John for our next panel. Cool. Thanks, Casey. Um, and I appreciate the kind words. Um, loved reading about your company as well. Um, so, as Casey mentioned, I'm uh, Mark Slasher. I head up a brand partnerships team at White Ops. And for those of you not familiar, White Ops is a cybersecurity company. Um, we analyze over 10 trillion interactions in any given week, and we help protect our partners from uh, sophisticated bots, which are designed to act and look exactly like humans. Um, so these bots are no longer just sort of clicking on ads or visiting sites. And now they're designed to do things like fill out multi-step form fills, enter into data streams to mimic retargeting and lookalike pools, and even listen to music, uh, oddly enough. And you know, White Ops is, is helping to protect brands, their full marketing stacks from these types of threats. As it relates to DTC brands, um, this means ensuring that, that only humans are entering through their performance marketing tactics, are that they're driving to site, um, on-site interactions such as form fills are not automated. And the result is really efficiencies in key metrics such as CAC, LTV, AOV, uh, clean data pools, and analytics that can be trusted. And so this is the newest battle that we're collectively fighting with the advertising industry against cyber criminals. And we're already seeing significant returns for our performance focused partners um, by increasing the digital marketing ROIs by over 6X. So um, excited to really dive right in. And, and John, great to be here and chatting. And so thank you for your time. Would love to, um, would be great if you could sort of introduce yourself here and tell us more about your role. All right, great. Hopefully you can hear me. Um, my name is John Sheldon. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer at Smile Direct Club. You hear me okay? Hear you loud and clear. All right, great. Yep. So, um, so I've been with the company about two years. And, um, you know, we, we have, uh, you know, had a pretty meteoric growth uh, in my time and what, you know the, the purpose of the company is to uh is to really help democratize access to a straighter smile smile that people will love um you know really focused on uh enabling that through kind of creating greater access to to care um through affordability we're about 60 percent less than other t-straightening options and convenience um you you can actually enter into you know, working with our brand uh, either entirely uh, from home or through one of our, you know, Apple store like shops or, uh, or, you know, working with your dentist. Cool. Every time I hear smile direct club, it does put a smile to my face for one reason or another. So you must have a good. very smiley office. All right. Good. Uh, when it's, when it's there. Um, so, you know, tell us, uh, you know, being part of white ops and being like a mission driven company that's out to disrupt the economics of cybercrime, you know, and you mentioned, you know, uh, very mission driven. But we'd love to just hear a little bit more about about how you, about your mission and how it's really sort of disrupting this space and how it aligns with with the work that you do today. Yeah, I mean, our our mission really is to is to is to open up the availability of 
uh, you know, smile care to a much broader audience uh, than, than ever before. 60% of the counties in the United States, for example, don't have uh, access to an orthodontist uh, res resident in the county. Um, you know, our, our solution and our uh, ability to allow somebody to take an impression kit at home and, and, and work with our uh, 250 dentists and orthodontists uh, via a teledentistry platform you know, enable that access. And, and we're in basically all of those counties, uh, you know, providing access to care that's never existed before. You know, for me, what I get a lot of um, reward about is, is those those deserts, if you will, of, of orthodontic care are most often in communities that are disadvantaged economically, um, that have been historically uh, left behind in the healthcare system. And so um, we're very proud that, that the, the businesses uh, you know, disproportionately servicing, you know, for example, African-American community, Latino community in the United States and, and you know, alternate uh, ethnicities in other countries that we're in, uh, in greater, uh, in greater uh, access as well. So we're in cool. about 10 countries. And it's, you know, it's super interesting. And I think one of the things that COVID has done is really sort of created and shown us where efficiencies could be created. And I think telehealth sounds like it's a it, 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 the the efficiencies have always been there, and now people are really just seeing their eyes to it. And the other thing is, is it's super interesting of what you just said is as socioeconomic disparity ha has happened even more due to COVID and, and people losing their jobs, it must be quite rewarding to be able to still reward, uh, still allow people um, to, to be able to have this access. Yeah, and when you're a disruptor in a space using technology the way we are, originally uh, tele telehealth, teledentistry, was a headwind, right? Everybody was fighting mm -hmm. with regulatory and so on. But I think we've all had our eyes open in this time period to recognize just how much value the ability to get your health care in a remote basis um, you really can bring to the table. And so we've seen what was originally a headwind for our business now uh, kind of flip around and, and, and propel us and is now a, a tailwind you know, for the business. Cool. It's a, it's a fascinating conversation. And so you essentially disrupted the dental industry, which is a fascinating thing, you know, uh, been around for a long time. And there, there, there must have been some sort of misinformation that could have been arisen by fear, um, especially from some of the uh, incumbents. You know, um, how do you sort of combat those challenges within the market? Yeah, that's that is an interesting challenge, right? The, the, the disrupted don't really enjoy it very much and then they're entrenched and they fight back. So. Mm -hmm. um, you know, industry groups in specific have you know been engaging, frankly, in a years-long misinformation campaign about about our business, and um, you know, we're, we're fighting those crises uh, every day. The great news is that that um, what they're saying is false, and we can prove it's demonstrably false. And we've had to, you know, we, we've been able to um, you know build out our credibility, bringing our doctors forward, um, demonstrating the power of our teledentistry network. And now. With over a million customers having gone through the treatment, you know, there's just a huge army of a million voices that can that can back us up when we say what we say about our brand, and and um, that's been you know one of the one of the key things that we've done most recently in the last several months is just bring forward the stories of actual successful customers and let them tell the story for you. That's been mm -hmm. um, that's been maybe our best way of of you know handling some of the misinformation and and, and education in the space. Yeah, for sure. And it's uh, relating to this conversation. It sounds like some of this is probably being done by just automated bots and something that we've seen and isn't uncommon. Um, and we've even seen like uh, just from reviews to, um, to even like public opinion polls trying to skew um, widespread opinion. Um, so, you know, you hit on sort of personal connection and, and do you find that that often is the best way to sort of combat that is just to tell the real stories of your customers and, and the access you provided? Yeah, so let me go back to your point about the bots just for a second and support your point, which is, you know, one of the things that we see is that every single, you know, social media post that we have has a handful of bots that immediately comment on it. All of them have no followers. They're all clearly not real people. Uh, they're, you know, they're just automated gunners that are set up to, to spread misinformation. Um, you know, we've been able to manage through that now. We've built the reputation, some of the reputation processes that we need, but that is definitely prevalent um you know in in the industry um you know i do think uh the, the uh, i'm sorry what was the second part of your question well it's just you know uh, the personal stories because if you tell yeah. for real people real humans is really the only way to sort of say that that this is not actually the case when you sell a transformation product the best way you can make your case is by showing the transformations and those mm -hmm. happen on an individual by individual basis and so we've really 
invested in uh, in you know getting to tell those stories, um, you know, which is really powerful. Our, our our most successful commercial on the market to you know to as of this moment, you know, is a is a um, is a commercial where the woman opens by saying, "Smile Direct Club changed my life." Right, and that, that Tremani is the woman who stars in that, and and you know you can just see all the ways that the, from beginning to end, you know, starting with helping her transform her smile has really impacted you know her life. You know, she's gone on to learn to become a midwife. She's got now a relationship in place. She's got promoted at work. She's got all kinds of things that have you know going on in her life that you know she would tell you started when she decided to go through this transformation of of her smile, and it gave her the confidence she needed to take on all these other things she was interested in. Yeah, for sure. And and so that's one thing that you probably have to tackle is is bots and 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 misinformation and 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 so showcasing those stories. You know, another thing I was recently, um, well, not even recently anymore, but when Casper IPO'd, I was reading um in the papers, they 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 published that there was over 250 or or some uh some number very close to that DTC brands, uh mattress brands that were created um after seeing their success. Um, have you seen similar trends um within your vertical? Um, to sort of duplicate the success that you guys have had, and how do you stay differentiated in that, those particular cases? Yeah, there's no question that there are copycat businesses that that are springing up. You know, the, the good news that we face in our business is there are some very significant uh, moats that protect this business and and make it extremely difficult to enter and to do so with um, with uh, economics that are going to work work for the business. You, you know, you you have to. You run the financing. You have to be able to manufacture your own aligners, and and then you have to be able to handle, you know, tons of customers. And you know, we've spent the last six years building up this teledentistry platform to really, you know, make sure that we uh, stay on the right side with regulators and so on. All of those things are really significant barriers to the business. Even so, uh, you know, about every six months, a new competitor will pop up, and because of our success, they'll get funded and. And you know, mm-hmm. there's no doubt if you search on our brand name today, you'll see one or two of them trying to pick up on our coattails, um, you know, in, you know, in different, uh, different social media or, or in, in paid media circles. But, um, you know, on the whole, uh, because of the moats around our business there, you know, we have, we have, a, a, I think, a better protection than, than maybe most disruptors. Yeah, that's kind of uh, fascinating just in terms of um, how regulation has allowed you guys to get a step ahead because so much work needs to, so much groundwork needs to be placed ahead. Um, but, you know, competition, generally speaking, is is definitely a good thing. And I'm sure it sort of drives you to, to, to go to the next level as well. Yeah, no doubt. And, you know, we've been able to create so many new customer experiences and so on that we've patented all throughout the way. We've got parts of our impression kit that are patented. We've got parts of our smile shop experience that are patented. And, and you know, as a business, you know, we're protecting those, um, you know, as part of uh, as, as we continue to innovate. Cool. That's a um, it's good conversation. And just to switch lanes slightly here, you know, largely in the same category of just performance innovation is, is really utilizing sort of data and analytics to ensure your brand and your bottom line continues to grow. You know, you're the CMO of a rapidly growing DTC brand, you know, obviously uh, continuing to grow, see competition, but you still have to be very data oriented. You know, so what are some of the ways that you use data and analytics today to drive your marketing decisions? Yeah, I almost would turn the question around. I can't. I can't even think of a way we're not using data to drive our decisions. And, and as a business that's a D 2 C brand, we have visibility, you know, to that data from top to bottom in our business. And you know, I literally, uh, you know, on in front of me here, four screens, you know, loaded with data flashing at me pretty much all day long. And and we're looking at whether it's customer data or site performance data or uh, marketing uh, effectiveness data, you know, we're looking at that stuff every every day, all the way down, by the way, through the customer experience. So I know how we acquired you at the beginning. And I also know at the, at the, at the bottom, you know, who made your aligners, who was a doctor that approved your, that, who approved your plan and worked with you on that plan, all of those elements. And I can help make sure that we're, we're tying those things together with a really cohesive customer experience all the way through. And, and so, yeah, the, the data access that I have as a marketer here, frankly, it's a dream come true. It's been, I've been in, in and around e-commerce and D2C for 25 years. This is really what I've been looking for, um, you know, as a leader to, you know, help drive decisions. And, and you know, if you look at our website right now, you, you might not notice this, but there are over 40, 40 tests going on in the U.S. website right now simultaneously. Wow. And, and you know, we're using that to you know, optimize and enhance our, our customer's experience from, from end to end. 
Yeah. So, and, and, and as you're talking about data here, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of an interesting conversation um, and, you know, we'll correlate this back a little bit to bots here. Has there ever sort of anything within your data that you're just like, this can't be real. And you're making tons of real time optimizations. You have 40 tests going and, and that's sort of um, that will infer a lot of your spend and, and the tactics that you're doing. Is there ever anything within your data that you're ever like, wow, this can't be real. Yeah, of course that happens. That happens all the time. And, and, you know, the biggest thing that it, what it shows is something broke, right? Where mm -hmm. we say, hey, we've been going along at 8% and all of a sudden something fell off the cliff. You know, consumer behavior doesn't change that dramatically over, over a short period of time. And so, you know, usually we have to go find out, you know, what, look, the data is showing us something that can't possibly be true, what broke. And then if that's, if that's not the case, you know, then we have to start looking into, you know, what are the different possible fraudulent elements that may have entered into the equation for us um, and, and we've had some of those issues in the past, um, you know, by way of example, you know, we had we had a series of bots that had previously, you know, gone in. We have limited slots in our in our smile shops and it was going in and automatically filling up a bunch of the slots and then nobody showed up. Uh, and so, you know, we, we've you know, we've built some of the things that we need to do to protect against that now. But that's an example uh, exactly of what you're talking about. And was that just, uh, and I'm curious, was that like a competitive assault or was that more of just somebody trying to get paid because you were paying every time an appointment was booked. Did you ever sort of figure that out? Uh, you know, it was, we don't know if it was a competitive assault. I'm not ready to make that yeah, accusation, yeah. but it's cer certainly, um, uh, you know, it was, it was nefarious and, and designed to take up valuable, uh, valuable spots in our, in our smile shops. And so, uh, you know, gladly we, we, uh, were able to identify, you know, how that was happening and where it was coming from and how to shut it down as fast as possible. You know, and it's um, it's it, it, it's I, I get fascinated by these conversations because you know we're married into this world of of cybersecurity and advertising, and um, I'm more on the advertising side, and most of the folks on my team are from the cybersecurity side. There's former FBI agents, former mm -hmm. Department of you know Defense, you know, all the three letter sort of organizations you can think of, and and I, I sort of learn new things every day in the the five years that I've been here, and. Um, like, you know, are there, you know, we've seen when we have conversations with folks, sometimes people have no idea that this exists and it sounds like you have a general idea and you've seen certain things. And, you know, sometimes we will turn on a campaign and we've seen up to 40% of paid traffic that spots, like, are there certain tactics sometimes that you steer away from just because you say, look, we're not getting enough authenticity from these numbers and, and they're not driving enough business outcomes. So ultimately, the big uh, the big issues that that you know, sorry, the big goals that we have in the business and how we measure and typically in every way we try how we pay is for something that either means somebody is showing up at a at an appointment that they that they booked, or um, they're returning the impression kit that we we mailed to their home. And so mm -hmm. at some point in the process, a real human has to be there. Right. Mm -hmm. um, or, or the next step doesn't occur. And the, and the good news is we've engineered a lot of the incentives in our marketing um, ar around and focused on ensuring that um, that's that's the point where where we would pay and and that you know, fraud can be kind of stuffed out of the system before that point to the best of our ability. There are elements where we could enter in, but we've we've worked really hard to kind of head that off of the pass and really engineer our marketing efforts to be more focused on ensuring uh, that we only pay once we can kind of ensure that a human has to be behind the next possible behavior. That's smart. And it's a good way to think about data and, and a good way to ensure that there is actually humans behind it. Um, you know, in, in terms of like data and analytics, you know, are there any gaps that you see in the market today? Yeah. I mean, anybody who's seen me speak at other events, no, I, I, uh, I have a, uh, a stump speech around data transparency and, and, and some of the, challenges and frustrations that I have, um, you know, with some of the walled gardens that are out there of, uh, that dominate uh, the media space. And it seems like that, you know, they continue to take away more and more of our ability to kind of stitch this stuff together. Um, you know, good news for us is we're big enough now that we're, we're building kind of back-ended ways of, of doing that, that, that work. But, um, you know, obviously the most transparency possible in a, uh, in a marketing environment is what I'm, what I'm looking for. So, you know, it's it's uh, it's trying to pull that out of uh, your, your biggest media partners is, is where I spend a lot of my time. So you're a big brand, you're a, you're a big title in terms of that. It has to be easier. Like, are you finding success 
in pushing the industry forward in this way? Or, or what are some tools that you can share with, with the folks on the, the call today, just in terms of where you found success? What are other areas that, that other folks can, can sort of join in collectively to help? Yeah, this is actually one of those spaces where, where I worry that there's going to be a bifurcation in the industry because the, the level of investment that we have to make to tie into these guys, APIs, to validate, to check it, to, to collaborate with them, to, to do that in meaningful ways, um, is, is, a, is a barrier that most brands aren't going to have the ability to, to, to do. And so, um, you know, I worry that, there, you know, in this walled garden world, there's going to be a little bit of haves and have nots. And, it's, you know, being on the have side, I guess I, sh I should like the barrier that that creates. But at the same time, I just don't, uh, you know, again, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big transparency guy, transparency of data guy. And, and you know, I think, uh, you know, the industry benefits when that transparency uh, goes from, from top to bottom. What are the key metrics that are missing in these worlds that you're getting from other worlds that you're not getting today from those wall gardens? Well, now, I mean, it's, it's you know, we're, we're even losing some of the, you know, the view through data and, and, and so on that uh, provides visibility to when, uh, you know, and how much somebody watched a particular asset or video that you've displayed. Um, you know, that's, that's one that we care about, um, you know, there, but, there's a, but there's a whole host of them. Um, you know, as it relates to retargeting, tightening retargeting windows, tightening, uh, you, know, uh, you know, pixel, uh, you know, data fires, you know, the browsers are now starting to take away what data gets passed around in the industry as well. And so it's, uh, you know, you're, you're, and I get, that's all in the name of, of privacy on, on the other end. And I, I do understand that. However, having come from a world, uh, you know, in MasterCard, who's solved this problem 25 years ago, I'd love to see the um, uh, the the walled garden media gardens you know, take some of the tips and tricks that that folks like Mastercard have figured out how to maintain privacy while communicating data um, to their to their core banks and uh, and and bring that into this world so that we can get better visibility uh, to to uh, marketing effective effectiveness. Yeah, it's fascinating, and I think a lot of these these areas, it's like like fundamentally they may have been built a certain way, and then all of a sudden, as the privacy issues began to grow, it just became impossible to even right the wrong from. Um, in 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 our world, you know, we've seen um, you know the programmatic space, funny enough, like clean themselves up a lot more, just because there's easier ways to integrate and there's easier ways to sort of um, implement for brands, for ad tech platforms. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the areas that, that you know, and one of the reasons why we created a new product, Marketing Integrity, was just because there, there's not transparency into whether there's humans being driven to site from so many different tactics out there, whether it's search, social. And, and so mm -hmm. what that's helping to solve is, okay, that's one point of analytics and data that's, that, that hasn't been available to marketers. And we were continuously hearing that such a large percentage of spend and so um, it gives sort of that, that, that extra level of transparency. So it's been something that, that we've been working on solving from our lens as well. Yeah, I mean, Mark, I think for me, where I think this has to get solved, it has to get solved on, on the media player side. Um, because, you know, short answer is, you know, we're, we're measuring effectiveness based on downstream metrics, not based on traffic alone. Mm. And so if you're the media player and then all kinds of bots are clicking through on your site, it's going to it's going to crush the performance on your site and and therefore you're just not going to get my dollars and that's uh that has been happening with uh, particularly some of the programmatic players that we've been working with um historically it, and I, I agree with you i've seen that some of that has been cleaned up and so um i i, I really hope fingers crossed that they're starting to you know get, get ahead of this a bit but um you know it, it, they're frankly the players you know in a in a world that has people like our business that can look at those downstream metrics um, that's just how we're going to, that's just how we're going to measure folks. And, and they're going to look terrible if all the bots are eating up the traffic. For sure. And I'm, uh, we're, we're, we're definitely in alignment there and it's, um, it's forward thinking marketers like yourself and, and something that we've really believed in is collective security and just forming like coalitions. It's help us do things like take down Eve where, you know, for one of the first times ever, there was, a. Uh, there was folks um, arrested in non-extraditable countries due to the collaboration we put together with the FBI and mm -hmm. many other industry leaders who are competitors in the space, and even brands sort of forming coalitions to ensure that. And we've seen, you know, certain areas more recently in the news as well. But 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 forward-thinking marketers that actually form coalitions and and aggregate the power together. We believe that's how you end and, and you disrupt the economics of cybercrime. So it's a really important thing. So um, shifting gears slightly, consumer mindset during COVID, 
Um, and then, you know, we'll, we'll definitely leave some time for Q&A. So if anyone has Q&A, please start dropping them in. And we, we'd love to sort of answer some of those. Um, there was a recent quote in eMarketer speaking about just like DTC brands um, that suggested consumers during COVID will shift from nice to have products to only buying need to have products during this time period. You know, curious on, on, on where the scale for Smile Direct Club falls into that consumer mindset. And, you know, I think, you know, everyone believes every DTC brand should be just killing it right now because you figured everything else out. But but how does consumer mindset play into sort of the, the results you've seen during this sort of global pandemic? Yeah, really two big things here, Mark, that, that are, you know, helping propel our business forward. One is we had the agility when uh, when this all hit to flip from being, you know, overwhelmingly in our, you know, in our shops um, to start the journey to overnight flipping to really utilizing our at-home impression kits as the as the primary way for people to start uh, start with uh, with our business and that that flipped over in about 3 days and the agility of our business to be able to adjust to that was really was really crucial and and we've been able to continue to 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 drive uh the business you know even though our primary entry point uh got shut off uh, you know on virtually no notice the the other piece here is um you know we're in a place where everybody's been sheltering at home and uh, there's a lot of realization now that, hey, this is the time I can work on myself. And so, um, you know, I'll go through this aligner treatment. Our typical aligner treatment is four to six months. And so, you know, you can emerge from this COVID period, um, you know, with a brand new smile. And, and by the way, when have you ever looked so much at somebody's face, you know, large on your screen? Um, people are looking at your smiles now more than ever. And so between Zoom, these four months away and everything else, the opportunity for people to um, to really use this as a transformation time has been, uh, uh, frankly, a very strong thing for our business. Such interesting standpoints. And as you're talking about it, I'm like, you know what? I could have actually started already. Maybe maybe it's my time to start tomorrow and work on my smile. I think it's uh, I think we're there. It's, it's it's a great point. I think like at home fitness has seen okay, like Peloton stock, which maybe it's seventy four plus today. Now it's insane. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, so so there's all you know at the home fitness. Um, Mira obviously just being purchased, and and Smile fits right into that category. So it's yeah, uh, it's great yeah. Point. By the way, the, the by the way, you can include in that the, the deal that Teladoc just did today. So mm. you know, the, a lot of this, a lot of this kind of telehealth business and tele, you know, and 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 remote fitness are really seeing a huge amount of uh, of of tailwinds propelling them forward right now. Cool, and you know we'll we'll wrap up with a final question before the Q and A here. You know. Um, where do you think, you know, what are we, August 5th, 6th, whatever day we're on now, you know, where are we in August as we finish up the summer next year? Like, like, where do we, what are we talking about as a world and as an industry? Any sort of, uh, Nostradamus predictions here? Yeah. You know, I think, uh, I think it's going to be a, uh, regional, um, response to what the crawlback is going to be. Um, and, and you're going to see that, just, you know, in the United States, we're going to see that on a global on a global basis as well. Um, you know, by a year from now, I hope we're at a place where every, where everybody has access to a vaccine. Um, but I, I also think that there's a possibility that we get in a wave where there's there's something like this every two to five years um, that that impacts the business. We're just such a globally connected world right now um, that, that the ability to spread something that's contagious like this is is quite real. I think, but at the same time, humans are unbelievably resilient. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, it's going to take us a little bit to, to, to really adjust to all of it. But, um, you know, I, I drove a thousand miles this last weekend, stopped at a bunch of rest stops. Every single person in the rest stops I stopped at was there with a mask, was staying away from each other, was polite to each other about the whole mm -hmm. situation. I know that's not true everywhere. It's, that was just my experience this weekend. But I do think that the resiliency of of people is going to shine through, and you know any economy bump is going to is going to you know is going to be short lived, uh, you know, with so much attention, um, you know, on the governmental level on ensuring the continued economy. So I, I, I'm an optimist. Uh, I'm an optimist about all of this. Uh, you know, might get a little worse before it gets better. I think that may be true, um, but but you know, for the most part, uh, I, you know, I think a year from now uh, we're recovered with new habits. One good story from driving a thousand miles. It's it's got to be one good stop. Your favorite place? Anything? Anything in that? <laughs> oh, it's hard to beat. It's hard to beat the hills of West Virginia. There you go. I have, I have a sister-in-law that went to WVU. I know it well. Um, with the recent, um, so now moving on to Q and A, if it's okay with you, please. 
difficult with the recent boycott of Facebook as well as the environment of COVID. Um, where have the marketing budget shifted? Is it more search, influencer, something else? Any sort of tidbits you can share there? Yeah, I mean, I, you probably could read the articles on this, but you know, the D2C businesses that rely on Facebook were, were, were a little bit less uh, 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 a part of the, the boycotts on Facebook. Nonetheless, every one of us wants to be able to diversify our, our marketing spend and comfortably shift between performance platforms. And so, uh, you know, we've used this time, uh, you know, in COVID where we've adjusted our budgets to really step all the way back and, and start from ground zero and build and build and build and make sure that every single thing that we're doing is creating incrementality and in the business. And, and uh, you know, it was it uh, Churchill who said, never let a crisis, good crisis go to waste. And um, we're using this time to really relearn about our business in, in the current uh, in the current world and uh and you know how we spend and what's driving incrementality um you know it's a huge part of that cool and i think that that's you could speak about marketing and you could speak about everything just with that there's so many that every day i run into something i go why weren't we doing that before and i think that that's that's for everything yeah yeah i, I have a sister-in-law who works in a restaurant she's saying why aren't these procedures that we're doing right now why wasn't that what we were always doing um, I think I think you're right. It's gonna you're you're gonna see everywhere an adaptation of of these behaviors, uh, you know, across across uh, you know even beyond the COVID time period. Cool. And uh, John, so Chris uh, Chris P asks, um, how are you balancing targeting versus scale, especially as it relates to CPA, and um, how are you considering the entry of brick and mortar into DTC, i.e., um, Walmart doubling SKUs. Walmart.com doubling SKUs. Yeah, so let's start, let's start with um, uh, targeting. You know, we, we do a mix of these things, right? I mean, uh, that, that, is the, that is the classic balance, but what we found, particularly with these, you know, broad scale, uh, you know, highly uh, information-based environments like a Facebook is opening up and letting the algorithm do its thing really helps and, and really mm -hmm. works. I can try to feed it intelligent data uh, along the way, critical signals that say, hey, that was a good one. That's not a good one. That's a good one. That's not a good one. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, their ability to then say, oh, you told me that was good. I see a bunch more people that look like that often goes you know, beyond what we can uh, do with targeting. And so by keeping the audiences a little bit more open, um, we found uh, more success. Cool. Um, um, the second part was about um, uh, excuse. Uh, uh, you know, Walmart and other retailers entering in D to C, um, you know, the D to C business is really hard. And, um, and there, there's a lot, I mean, again, I've been in and around e-commerce doing going D to C for 25 years and, and there's just a lot of hard work that they're going to have to do. Walmart's going to be successful. They've got the market, um, to be able to do it. It's, it's the, uh, I think what you're seeing right now with some of the, the bankruptcies and so on that are happening and kind of this slightly smaller, the next tier down of retailers is, that transition is, is going to prove to be extremely costly. And we're going to see kind of turnover in what the leaders are in varying categories um, as critical D2C businesses, you know, step in to fill the void. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's been, it's, you know, one of the sad things about, about this, uh, about COVID um, has been seeing sort of those um, historic brands that are filed for bankruptcy and, and, and how could they rebound if at all. So, you know, what is sort of the, um, what do you sort of see as the future? It's a big question here to, to retail and e-commerce and, and sort of the biggest opportunities to take away. So I, I was looking at a McKinsey study the other day that basically said this COVID period accelerated our transition to digital by about nine years. And awesome. I, I believe it. Um, it, it, it. What is happening was ultimately inevitable in terms of what's available from data, what's available in brands and so on. But you know, really, the fact that that this got so accelerated, um, you know, I think, uh, frankly, is very exciting, and uh, is something that, as a brand, we're trying to make sure that we're leaning into really heavily as well. That's uh, it's, it's a it's a great statistic. I I, I did not hear that. Um, I did not read it. So thank you for sharing that. Um, in terms of like nine X, what do you think was lagging the most? in terms of um, the digital landscape that, that, that you think accelerated here? Well, I, th I think we've all learned about, you know, what can actually be done from home. Um, mm -hmm. and, and now more than ever, uh, that has more appeal and greater appeal. And so, you know, that's something, uh, you know, again, our brand has seen a massive amount of, 
of shift to our at home impression kits and, and, and communicating with doctors via via telehealth. I mean, we, we, we have a, a video chat, a feature that uh, we're, you know, all of our customer service have access to connecting to c consumers. And you say, oh, this aligner, I've got something wrong with it. Can I show you? And then we, we flip over onto video cam and they just show it to us. We say, oh, I see why. Let's do this. And we can solve that problem for people, you know, frankly, faster than ever. And so, um, you know, the, the, the high bandwidth combined with uh, a need to stay at home and, and the kind of the ingenuity that goes with that has really shown us how much can be done, uh, you know, without having to drag ourselves into some place. Yeah. And I think, you know, one of the things that, that I just, I, I'm, that relates and correlates really well to me is, you know, I'm a father to a, a two month old son and, um, Congratulations. And thank you. And, you know, I've just been the, the ability to spend time with my wife and take calls when I need to, but at the same time, really enjoy my parental leave. And just, you know, um, if I'm at home and I, I work a couple hours a day, like that's that's all possible now. And, um, but it's really allowed me to enjoy my time because, you know, in, in, in normal years, we're, a lot of us are on airplanes, just nonstop going to conferences and I get it too. a few times. And, and, and man, it's like, wow, I, I hear this all the time. It's like, wow, it's refreshing not to hop on another airplane. I bet. Yeah. For me too. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's been great, um, from that perspective. And I know that we're coming up on time here and I know that because I see Casey is hopping on. Hey, Casey. Hey, great chat guys. Um, and John really fascinating what you're saying about the, the Facebook boycott being, it sounds like more of, more of a, a wake up call to reduce dependence, uh, on, on, uh, the social platforms. Um, but with uh, with some of the comments, Mark, you were saying about how programmatic and those ecosystems have been been cleaning up. Um, uh, we are seeing a, a lot of brands uh, looking more to programmatic, where it is more um, it is measurable, and and it's come a long way in terms of uh, uh, both brand safety and and uh, less 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 rampant fraud. Uh, where I know there were a few years where it was pretty much expected that you were, you were seeing a lot of that. Um, but yeah, re really, really fascinating. Um, I, I wish we had more time for, for you guys, uh, um, but uh, we, we do have our, our next re next session ready. Um, but uh, thank, thank you so much and, and fascinating conversation. Uh, would like to introduce, um, coming up next, uh, is, Thanks, is Chris Pernay. Thanks, John. Thanks, Casey. Yep. Thanks, guys. Talk soon. Um, Chris Pernader from Koya and, uh, and, and Rob um, from Jelly Smack uh, com coming back. Um, so you guys should be should be popping up here. Um, Rob, can you hear me all right? I can, Chris. Can you hear me? This is Casey. Uh, yeah, just just uh, oh, Casey, rather. Sorry. And it looks I was like looking at Chris's name on the. Yep, looks like Chris is on as well. So I'll I'll let you take it away, Rob. Thanks, guys. Hey guys, how you doing? Okay, thanks, Casey. Hey, Chris, how are you? Very good. Good. Good to see you again. Can you hear me? Okay. I can. Okay. Terrific. Where where are where are you? Uh, working from w wfh'ing <laughs> yeah i'm from uh, I'm, I'm in austin texas awesome austin, austin, texas, austin right now. texas very hot right now austin texas over 100 degrees but uh but a great town nonetheless great i'm i'm in uh, greenwich connecticut which until yesterday was filled with lots of large trees and now a bunch of them have been knocked down by a crazy hurricane we had yesterday so Time to get out the chainsaw yeah the the, cha the, cha the sound of chainsaws is echoing around the neighborhood <laughs> And uh, 2020, just, you know, the year that keeps giving. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll just super quickly introduce myself. And then, and then I'd love for you, Chris, to, to talk um, a little bit about your background and, and some of the um, really cool and iconic brands that you've worked with um, and, and how, the, how your, your journey led to, to where you are now. Um, so for those just joining the call, hi, I'm Rob Gregory. I'm the um, president of sales and marketing of Jelly Smack. I'm a longtime media veteran, was in the print world for many years, um, most recently was a co-founder of Huse, the influencer marketing company that started very early in the influencer boom around 2010 um, and was acquired by Viacom CBS uh, la last year. Um, at Jelly Smack, our company is named uh, metaphorically for a school of jellyfish. That's what a Jelly Smack is. And uh, the reason for that is because jellyfish travel together in packs and they exhibit um, patterns and like-minded behavior. And that's a, a metaphor for the way people behave on, on social media platforms around various passion points. And that's, that's our core business at Jelly Smack is to build communities 
around verticals like gaming, sports, health and wellness, um, beauty, uh, and so forth. And we also have a proprietary technical process that breaks down and identifies and isolates the patterns that makes people or fans uh, on social platforms consume certain types of content uh, dramatically more uh, in a more engaged ways uh, engaged way than than other types. And we we use this technology to build our own social publishing verticals. And now we're working with performance oriented brands to um, use that that technology and those um, communities to sell products. So um, that's the Jelly Smack public service announcement. So Chris, can you can you talk about a little bit about about your background and some of the stops on the way and and uh, and then maybe transition into your into your current uh, job? Yeah, yeah. So we'll, I'll start in reverse order. Right now, I'm chief marketing officer for Koya Plant Based Nutrition, um, an amazing brand and company, uh, really creating and delivering consumers delicious plant based nutrition, and that's that's our mission. Um, for the last 20 years, I've been working in consumer products. I started at a really great company, Nestle Waters, uh, working through you know a number of the regional spring water brands, Ozarka, Poland Springs up in the Northeast, Arrowhead out in the West, um, and was a senior brand manager over in, on over innovation at, at uh, Nestle Waters, and was recruited over to uh, a startup that was really doing amazing in the East Coast, amazing in the West Coast, called Vitamin Water Smart Water, and. I spent three and a half years as part of the Vitamin Water Smart Water team, uh, building up that business until we sold that, that the company to Coca Cola. Uh, I lived in Atlanta uh, for about eight years. I, I worked for Coca Cola for a year after after uh, selling to Coke, um, and then joined a team of folks who bought a small brand uh, called Pirates Booty, um, and it, it was a small brand, you know, around fifteen million. Um, in about three and a half years, we took a lot of the same marketing tactics and strategies and blocking and tackling and uh, grew that business from around 15 million to 90 million and sold to B&G Foods for almost 200 million. Um, after that, I, I worked for Encore Consumer Capital, a uh, really fantastic venture capital company out of San Francisco, uh, doing amazing work with some amazing brands. I helped CMO a couple of their brands, Sheila G's Brownie Brittle and CC's VeggieCo. But last year, uh, I had the opportunity to meet Chris Hunter at Koya Plant Based Nutrition. I'd already been a consumer um, of Koya about uh, early 19. I was on a, my beginning of the year keto diet kick, and uh, I, I discovered Koya Keto, a fantastic product, a, a smoothie with uh, two grams of net carbs and, and indulgent, delicious, and delivering around nine grams of protein. and and really healthy fats and C8 MCT oil. And, and uh, I was hooked as a consumer. Uh, I met Hunter at the end of the year and we started talking about his business and his brand and one conversation led to the next. And, and then I found myself as a CMO of Koya and couldn't be more excited about Koya and our products and our brand and the team that I work with at Koya, just a fantastic team. Awesome. Uh, you know, I was just thinking it's a, you, you've got a really unique triangulation background of having been on the on the VC investor side, on the iconic CPG major brand side, and then now on the D to C side. That's a that that must give you a lot of really interesting um, interesting pr perspective. That's 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 terrific. So I, I yeah, want to come I'll, back. I'll, I'll tell yeah, you, you know, just uh, being fully candid. D 2 C is the newest part of, of, of my experience, to be quite honest. I mean, we um, just relaunched D 2 C this year, uh, Koya did at the beginning of June, um, really as a response to everything that was happening with, Koya, uh, with, with COVID-19 and, and this era of social distancing and also the havoc it wreaked on, on uh, you know, brick and mortar retail. And, and look, you know, for Koya, brick and mortar retails, it's still our number one priority. It's super, super important. but as our consumer fan base was was facing you know issues with availability um you know obviously looking for options not to go to the grocery store um but still wanting their koya uh we had to pivot and we had to reintroduce dc we we actually had it in 19 um and failed actually we we were not a very good dc company um mainly because we didn't start dc with the in the right framework with a business plan and a business setup that really uh, would contribute to a, to a positive um, and accretive business for for Koya, 
And so uh, going into June, we completely pivoted and, and really reinvented our approach to DC. And so far, so good, about eight weeks in. Yeah, that you know what they say, the, the, um, the view from the canvas is often very uh, enlightening and informative. So, um, and when we had our pre-call, you were you were super candid about about the round one of your of your D to C efforts uh, and how it was not super successful. Can you can you, can you tell just can you expand a little bit on that? Because I think pe people always learn from that kind of candor and 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 maybe talk a little bit about when how how quickly did you realize that um, you guys weren't doing it in a way that was that was going to be as successful as you wanted it to be. Like what were the signs and the the biggest sign was we're losing about fifty dollars per order. Okay, <laughs> that's, 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 that's that up on volume, right? You know, we uh, when we launched, we tried to you know really take care of a lot of the logistics and everything in terms of fulfillment in house, and we were doing all of our fulfillment out of California. And you know, as a cold chain product, we are a cold chain product. We you know we're found in the refrigerator section of your grocery store, often in the produce department. Um, and so, you know, cold chain, there's challenges with D2C. You have to, you know, if you're going to ship uh, ground, it has to arrive uh, in no less than two days, you know, max two days. Um, it's, and, and, if, and then if you are trying to ship across the country, which we were doing and what we learned quickly, we launched D2C last year and quickly found out that 65, almost 70 percent of our orders were coming from the East Coast. And here we were fulfilling all of our orders from the West Coast. And so it was a losing proposition in terms of, you know, we didn't realize because we were a California startup brand, we didn't realize that that the East Coast was going to drive so much demand on a DTC front. And so we weren't set up to properly address it. The second go around, we've actually partnered with Dot Foods, who's a huge logistics company in the country. We're now just you now we're shipping our DTC orders from three different distribution points throughout the country where two day delivery to 96% of the country, right? right? So you get efficiency with that. You're able to handle the cold chain. Um, and you're also from a customer experience standpoint, you're, you're serving a much better, uh, experience in terms of ordering and receiving Koya. So we're much better set up. We're set up for profitability. Uh, we made an initial investment in month one. Uh, to get the site up and running and, and to get everything set. We look like we'll be break even right into going into into in the month two uh, in terms of the money we're making and pulling off of our D2C sales versus uh, what we're spending to deliver. So really excited about where we're headed. Um, we've had a lot of help and a lot of partners involved, and that's really helped as well. That, that's that's terrific. I, I, I want to get into um... – uh, channel mix and media mix and 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 so you know how you're thinking about the marketing funnel these days in, in a minute before we do that can you talk a little bit more about um the brand itself and and it's um it's it's spirit it's it's reason for being it, it it's purpose I, I i know it's got a really strong um uh individuality and the you know the when when you when you when you look online you see things like um, it's for pescatarians and vegetarians, librarians and humanitarians, um, and fun stuff like that. Um, so, and, and, and you know, I also want to ask you about the, um, you know, the 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 plant based community and that customer, and and how you know how that's changing. Um, but maybe start a, a little bit about the the brand itself. What 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 does it stand for? What does it mean? Why why does it have um, fans and not just customers? You know, it was. I think that the you know the co-founders you know Maya French and Dustin and then even Chris Hunter who came in and later really helped them commercialize the company and really reinvent the brand to Koya. Um, it, the first the first and foremost uh, you know origination of the Koya brand was about need and you know it was about these health and fitness minded um, people who really wanted to find a protein nutrition product without the dairy, Maya actually had a dairy intolerance. And so for her, it was really important to find that protein source without the, without the whey protein, right? And, you know, in a, in a, in a category dominated by whey protein, um, that, was a, that was a huge challenge. The other opportunity though, I think as, as kind of things have evolved and as sustainability and, and, and kind of initiatives around uh, better for your nutrition and also about removing sugar from our diets, 
um, as, as our health-minded leaders have really kind of looked at the Koya opportunity, what started carving out for Koya was this opportunity to, to really deliver convenient plant-based nutrition uh, solutions that were delicious. Um, and that's what makes, you know, when we talk about Koya being for everyone, um, and that's kind of the pun in that, you know, for us, it's all about taste. You know, and uh, we saw a study recently, 65% of the time consumers will choose to repeat buy a product solely based on taste. Taste is that number one priority for consumers. Um, and so for us, like making our brand and this making plant-based nutrition approachable from a taste standpoint was, is really, really important. When you look at our flavors, you'll see things like cake batter and, and chocolate peanut butter and, and chocolate brownie and, and the vanilla bean, like universally beloved flavors that consumers already know and already have, a, you know, a, an expectation for. Well, we actually, we have this, this woman in our product development side who is just a magician and she delivers on that expectation with the taste in, in our Koya products. And so that's a huge, huge opportunity for us because, you know, consumers are going to choose what they like. At the end of the day, they're very simple, right? They, 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 they fall in love with products based on how it makes them feel, based on the experience of consuming that product. 65% of the time, it's taste that's really driving that, that ultimate decision. And so for us, the fact that we can deliver an incredible tasting and delicious smoothie, but with the plant-based nutrition and the low sugar and the high nutrition uh, content that we're putting in our in our protein and in our C8 MCT oil and, and adaptogens that we're starting to launch, like, it's amazing that we're able to meet that consumer need with, with a better option. And that's the key is just providing an option that consumers can really fall in love with. When, when things happen in the, um, in the plant-based food space that, that get into the zeitgeist and make news like Burger King and the impossible Whopper and, and that, that type of thing, does it help you guys? You know, that's a great question. I'm not sure. Um, you know, we, you know, I, th I think that um, the other side for us that's really, really important is we try to keep our ingredient panel as simple as possible, right? right. You know, our, we have a proprietary blend of protein, plant-based protein, and it's from peas and chickpeas and quinoa. Um, and then we use almond milk base in some of our products. We use coconut milk base in some of our products. And now we're even using oat milk um, and, as a base in some of our products. So, you know, we keep things very simple, um, because I think at the end of the day, there is this, there is this kind of tension be, be, between consumers seeking better nutrition and less sugar, but then also some of the complexities of fabricated nutrition and maybe fabricated um, plant-based solutions. And so um, we're trying to keep things very simple. We think that's important to our consumer base. It's something we hear back over and over again from our consumers. Um, and so we stay focused on that. We stay focused on very simple, delicious plant-based nutrition. Um, and, and, and I think that that's what's working for us right now. Does the pandemic make people more health conscious and more aware about what they're, what they're putting into their bodies? And, and, and I, I would think, at the same time, there's also obviously this narrative about um, this being a wake up call for the planet and what we're doing to it and, you know, environmental sustainability and, and how how all these things intersect. So is that is there is there a silver lining in the in the current um, pandemic environment that 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 you think underscores the um, the values behind the brand? Yeah, I, we are unfortunately in a unique position um, to really uh, support kind of the trends. And, and I think that, look, there's, I mean, look, there's a lot of fear um, and there's a lot of concern and there's a lot of anxiety about what's happening, not only with the pandemic, but with our planet. And, um, and we believe we are a better solution in the mix. Um, and, and, and we believe that we um, have a, you know, it is definitely part of our mission to be responsible in how we, you know, produce our products and create the right products. All our products are project non-GMO verified. Um, we, you know, we are absolutely vigilant about supporting consumers and what they need. 
I absolutely believe the pandemic is going to accelerate uh, consumers' focus on what they're putting in their bodies. And and right now, I mean, if you're a, a, a product supporting immunity, you're absolutely on fire. I mean, that you know, consumers are looking to protect themselves right now more than anything. Um, right. And and so they're building, they're doing everything they can to build up their immunity. And and we certainly are going to be as much as, as we can. Um, a part of supporting that process. And even from an innovation standpoint, it's made us really reconsider, you know, what products we're bringing to market, what new products we're going to, to, we're going to develop to support consumers in this, in this, you know, you know, need for, for better for you immunity boosting products. Absolutely. Yeah. So just, just thinking for a minute as a, um, you know, as a general marketer and also as a, um, you know, as a senior business executive who works with teams and employees and, you know, customers and, and, and human beings and all, all of that. Um, we've had, we've had this crazy four months and, you know, in June, a lot, I get, I know this depends a lot on what part of the country you live in. I, I, you know, I live in the New York work, live and work in the New York area. Um, it seemed like things were getting better. And then, and then the last month or so, um, not so much. And, you know, uh, obviously there've been, there've been setbacks and resurgences and, uh, you know, something of a domino effect. I know as a longtime media and, you know, brand marketing person, uh, for me, when they canceled CES, um, last week, uh, you know, the CES in January of 2021, that was a bit of a realization moment. And, you know, we talked about this at jelly smack with our team where, where we said, you know, um, this is settling in for a long haul and nobody knows how long, but it's going to be a longer haul than we thought, right? All, all, all of it, the, the, the way consumers, um, feel the way they shop, the way people work, um, you know, working from home, uh, all, all of, all of these things. So are, are you and your, your team beginning to shift from thinking about when this is over? to thinking about this as in some ways um kind of a new reality and and you know something that has certain aspects that are just that that, that may continue for you know a, a significant amount of time yeah we 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 absolutely are and um you know we you know while our strategy of of really sharing koi and driving trial and, and building awareness around kind of what we represent and our mission hasn't changed how we're allocating our resources to to do all of those things has changed dramatically obviously i mean we were heavily you know field marketing focused um driving trial is so efficient when you've got a field marketing team who can who can connect with thousands of consumers and and have them try the product and we you know we believe trials the most important thing for koya we believe you know out of every two people who try a koya one's going to get to the store and buy it right and we, we believe that wholeheartedly and so you know, we are, we have had to shift how we drive that trial. Um, and, you know, we, we're a virtual company. We, we actually don't have a home office as a company. So, you know, a lot of like how we work hasn't changed. You know, we're, we're very Google oriented and it's Google meetings and, and Google calendars and Google shared files. And, and we do a really fantastic job of, of having rhythms and, and rapport on how we communicate and how often we get in front of each other. No one ever calls each other. It's always video conference chat. So we've been video conferencing, you know, each other since way back. And, and so it's, it's not new to us. Um, but, you know, for us in terms of engaging consumers, we're really having to rediscover um, how to create that trial. You know, we're, we're still a new product. We're, you know, 40 million retail sales strong, uh, but that's very small and young um, in the life cycle of a CBG company. And so we have a lot of consumers to connect with and a lot of consumers that still need to learn more about Koya and, and finally try it. So, you know, we are, we, we've just, you know, we've made some, some investments and we've made some pivots to really, really focus on our Koya community. Um, and we launched at the beginning of the year, um, a loyalty program called the Koya crew. Um, it quickly grew. Uh, we we're over 6,000 strong and crew loyalty members. Um, and by the way, you know, Everyone should become a Koya crew member because you get a lot from us. We are very generous with our Koya crew members because 
we get so much the Koya group because they give us so much back in terms of insights and information and how they feel about our products and what products do they want from us and what flavors do they love and which flavors can use improvement. And so it's an amazing relationship. But the other thing the Koya crew um, it does for us, and Emily touched on this a little bit, but they share, right? And some nice. of our crew and, and you know, are, are, are silent and, and, and they're not big shares. But some of our crew members have followings and some of our crew members are influencers and and some of those influencers become community members that we then start building better and, and even more integrated direct relationships with because they become, you know, true foghorns for our for our brand and and really share um, news for us. You know, one of the things we're doing uh, is we're driving what we call virtual trial. And, um, you know, I'm sure you're familiar with kind of how hot the kind of box opening videos are yeah so yeah we talked we talked about that on the on the prep call and it, that's what i was going to ask you in a, in a in a world where it's 60 or 65 percent taste driven how do you do a virtual trial yeah so we, we're connecting with these influencers the ones you know micro to macro to to big influencers we're sharing our latest innovation you know that's one of the tough parts is we had a lot of innovation planned march through june um and uh and and we're stuck in a situation where we couldn't go out and connect with consumers at stores or at retail for them to try these brand new products. And so we uh, we connected with our influencers. We uh, partnered with Active Campaign to you know to automate our customer uh, experience and and really built a system for kind of not only engaging but identifying influencers who would who would uh, who would try our new products and and share that experience of trying the products and. And so literally sending boxes of, of, uh, of our brand new products to these influencers, they'll videotape themselves, you know, ordering, receiving, opening the box, taking it out, and then opening it up and having that very first sip of like one of our new flavors, chocolate peanut butter. Um, and it's amazing because, you know, it's, it's a little bit of, there's a little bit of risk. I mean, obviously if they don't like it, it it becomes not a great video to just yeah, because they, they do it. They yeah. do a spit take on camera. That's <laughs> exactly. not a, that's not a good look for the brand. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You don't want that. So, um, <laughs> but, you know, but, you know, it, it's amazing. We have a lot of confidence in our products and, um, you know, our influencers have done an amazing job of sharing that experience of that first taste. And so in a way you get that credibility of the influencer because the following is following them for a reason. And, and you, and so indirectly, you know, their following gets to experience trying Koya for the first time uh, through that influencer. And that, that's a big opportunity for us. So we're, we continue to double down on that. That's, that, that's something, you know, for us, influencers have to first be a part of our community. Um, we're not out seeking a lot of, you know, uh, sponsored influencer partnerships unless there was already a relationship with that influencer. That's really important. How, how, do, you find, how do you find them? Like the, the 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 fans who are also the vocal fans and the and and and, and highly social themselves. How, yeah, how, do you, I have how, a, how do you systematize the process for for finding them and engaging them and put, putting them on the on the team, so to speak? I have a small but very talented team. As a CMO, I'm more of a person that empowers talent than does anything myself. And so, you know, I have to credit you know my my digital team, Sven and Diane, are just. They're fantastic, not only from a technology standpoint and knowing what partners to to, uh, to partner with, but they're also incredible consumer listeners. And they do a really great job of listening to consumers, using tools to listen to consumers. We don't find influencers. Influencers find us. Um, they connect with us. They, they, they tell us about their discovery of our product. They tell us about what it means to them. And those are the, those are often the influencers that we build the most productive and incredible relationships with. And, so Sven and Diane have done an incredible job of, of leading that process and um, and really making sure that they are tooled to actively have those conversations with not, you know, 10 or 20 influencers, but hundreds and, and thousands of influencers. And so um, they're doing a fantastic job of that. And it's really, we've really seen the benefits of that, you know, going into, into, into the COVID era and knowing that we were shutting down field market and some of those things. You know, we refocus some of those field marketing professionals to become more active listeners for us. And so we have multiple people, you know, connecting with consumers on our social platforms every day. We try to address every comment and every every um, request uh, personally with with people from Koya and, 
and that's really paying off and paying dividends. Um, and so, you know, it, it's it's a it's a exciting time. We feel like every inch we've gained during the COVID era is, is definitely going to produce miles of benefit here going into 2021. And so we're banking on that. That's for sure. So it's that art and science mix, right? Of hu of human, literally human listening, and yes. you know, attention and intuition and and uh, and data analytics and 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 automated tools. Yep. yep. And then you know, the other thing, you know, we brand partnerships. I mean, it's amazing. I, I feel like sometimes hesitancy for for brands to partner or to kind of almost open themselves up to the vulnerabilities of some of those partnerships. One of the things we've done is just actively pursued partnerships with meal delivery service companies, with other brands who are out there doing the same thing we are, trying to drive trial. Um, brands with kind of similar missions or at least, you know, similar values in terms of what they're providing consumers from a nutrition and, and uh, brand experience standpoint. And that has just been an amazing process. And so, you know, providing a meal delivery service, a, a surprise and delight free Koya to send with their meals to their consumers. You know, it's an expense, it's the cost of goods, but that partnership has just absolutely delivered, you know, an, an amazing amount of trial and an incredible response from those meal delivery service consumers. And and if those consumers are paying extra for meal deli delivery service, believe me, they're, they're in a great position to pay extra for better nutrition and better plant-based smoothie solution. So, um, you know, it's been really incredible to expand our reach through partnerships. And uh, we have someone again in, in our team, McKenna, who leads that process, and she just does a fantastic job. That's great. Shout out to McKenna. So, I mean, with the with the Koya crew, I assume crew is spelled with a K. You got it. Yeah. OK. <laughs> just took a stab there. Um, do, do you are, are you do you keep contingency plans in place for IRL sampling and actual experiential events and you know f physical ways that the that the um, the fan base can can be in, be engaged and and you know stay um, stay part of the family. You know we're trying and we really hope to get back to that as soon as possible. Right, we want to get back to events, yeah. back to partnerships to get in front of the consumer. Um, we're sponsoring the AVP volleyball events down in in Florida and and those have been televised and you'll see the Koya logo up, but it's just not the same when you're not there physically, right? It's not the same when you're celebrating those events with the fans. Um, and so we really, you know, we've, we, we, uh, one of our missions going into COVID era was to protect our people and we haven't had any, any layoffs associated with COVID. And, and so our team who actually McKenna leads that team, that experiential event based field based uh, marketing effort, you know, She's in the ready mode, um, and while she's pivoted and, and focused on other areas of, of connecting the brand to consumers, we are still actively listening to what's happening and really trying to understand when, you know, those the gates will be open and how do we get back to connecting with consumers safely, right? And I think right. everyone needs right. to be focused on that. So we're, you know, we're, we're, we're researching, we're listening, we're talking with partners. There's a lot of, you know, brands and, you know, you know, whether it's the Miami Dolphins or or you know or the CrossFit gym down the street, we're having those conversations with these folks about you know what do they see, what's their outlook, when are they going to get back to servicing people in person, um, and how can we support them? And yeah. so, you know, a lot of what we're doing right now are, are product drops. We're literally we're not doing wet sampling. We're literally dropping cases of product to beaches or to outdoor workout areas or you know to to any events where people are out trying to kind of connect in a socially distant, safe way. And so uh, we're continuing to seek those opportunities as well. That's great. I hope I stumble upon one. It sounds, it sounds like, like a lot of fun um, and it's a, it's a great product. So just switching a little bit to um, your, 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 your media mix when, when, and we, we had talked about this uh, with Emily on the previous call, how, you know, a lot of things that were happening naturally um, that that might have taken five years are now happening this year. Um, actually, on the call prior to this one with Smile Direct, um, there was a nine-year theory that, yeah. that the acceleration into digital um, 
that would have taken another nine years is happening in one year because of COVID and just, you know, speeding up the movie across the board. So how how are you thinking, you know, maybe start with some of the social platforms like this. Everybody's obsessed with TikTok right now and um facebook is in the news with their boycott and they're you know they're they're continuing um drama how 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 are you thinking about those different platforms how do you how do you test them um do you think maybe i'll start by just asking you about TikTok. do you think it's going to be banned or do you think microsoft's going to buy them and they're just getting warmed up yeah i think microsoft's going to definitely buy them and i think um i think TikTok will continue i got a 14 year old daughter who was on musically before music before TikTok was TikTok. Before it was and TikTok, so, right. You know, so so I've seen this platform grow and emerge and it's an amazing way to uh, connect with younger consumers. And now, you know, that 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 consumer group is migrating um and expanding both age wise and obviously by numbers. And and right. it, you know for us it, it, it continues to be, you know, for us the focus is is still community. I mean, you know, one of the things we want to do is continue our direct connection and communication with our consumers. We continue actually funny enough, age old, we, we continue to try to build on our, on our, our email subscriber list. I mean, it, it's a great way to continue to connect and communicate with consumers. Um, but we're also, nothing, there's nothing like email, right? There's nothing like email. It's amazing. I mean, yep. you know, launching D to C that email subscriber list became, um, you know, an incredible launching pad in terms of announcing our D to C offering and, 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 and promoting it. And, and getting amazing amount of orders from it, um, but then at the same time we're also developing SMS, ca you know, uh, capabilities so that we can we right. can have you know uh, you know relationships with our consumers through their mobile phone and 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 making that relationship and that communication as easy as possible. Um, so you know it, it's it's an interesting time. I agree in some of the theories around digital, like even in brick and mortar retail and in grocery environment. That you know, I've often thought that you know. D to C for food products, honestly, isn't about getting shipments direct to consumers, but using the network of 20,000 grocery stores around the country as many warehouses for your products and shipping in an hour or two from that grocery store to your consumers, like enabling that process. Um, I think it was was really uh, something that we were focused on through Instacart, through Shipped, uh, through some of the groceries uh, companies own delivery platforms. Uh, click and collect has absolutely exploded. Click and collect is where you order your groceries and then have it ready to be picked up right on the curbside. Um, these services have exploded. And what's happened through the COVID era is it's really forced the consumer to change the way they they buy groceries and they they, they consume products. Um, for us- that, That's what you mean by winning, winning on the couch versus winning on the shelf. Yeah. For That's us, you know, the, the consumer spending so much time preparing for their shopping trip. Uh, they're building their shopping list at home because the process of either ordering those groceries online and picking them up, or if that single household member who owns that process of going into the store with mask and, and hand sanitizer and everything to get in and out as fast as possible, they have their list ready to go. They're meticulous and they're in and out of the grocery store as soon as possible. We, as a new brand and an, as an emerging brand, we lost that point of sale impulse purchase opportunity, right? Instead of the browsing shopping consumer, are, the consumers are on a mission to get those those essentials and those needs and those groceries and get out. And so, you know, losing that opportunity, we realized that we needed to shift a lot of our marketing strategy. We've always said invest as many marketing dollars as close to the point of purchase as possible, but we have to now shift that investment thesis on now making sure we're not just winning at the shelf, but really winning at the couch. We have to get the consumers right. to make the decision by Koya before they ever hit the submit order button or before they ever, you know, start on their trip and their journey into the grocery store. So it's really become important for us to embrace that opportunity to connect with consumers sooner in their in their shopping cycle and make sure we get in front of them and, and communicate to them. And so we're very, very busy and very, very active in all of the social channels. And yeah, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of chaos and a lot of um, a, a lot of change happening. Um, we're kind of keeping our head down and doing everything we can just to make sure that we keep our connection with our community. And we've got a very, um, a very passionate and very engaged community. And so we're just doing everything we can to maintain that.
um, through all the changes yeah. and, and unravel. Super, super smart, Chris. I think we're almost out of time. There, there, there are a, a, a couple of questions. Um, do, do you, is there anything coming up in terms of um, new products or brand extensions or um, announcements you can tease or th things that either later this year or next year that you're excited about? We are. We're, again, you know, as we as we evolve our plant based nutrition uh, portfolio, we're continuing to innovate to address different needs that honestly that our consumers bring to us. Um, and so we've got two innovations actually launching this month. Uh, everyone keep quiet. This is this is new news and not in stores yet. But the first uh, the first line of products that are coming out from Koya are called Koya Thrive, and it's a brand Koya new. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll show you a, a quick bottle shot here. Koya Thrive. And it's a brand new line of products from us um, that are oat milk based. This is our first product that's oat milk based. And so therefore it's our first product that's uh, big eight allergen free. Um, so free of all of the big eight allergens, um, you know, about 5% of adults and 8% of children are, have some type of food allergy. And so, you know, for us, this was an opportunity to introduce oat milk into the mix of our plant-based nutrition. But then we also included super herb adaptogens into this mix. So. Uh, for example, this particular one is called Miracle Matcha, and it's got matcha, spirulina, uh, uh, and uh, moringa in it. We've got another one uh, called Golden Turmeric, and it has turmeric, uh, ginger, and black pepper. Um, and you know, Yum. so these these adaptogens are incredible, and they're, they're they're things that consumers are looking for. Again, we talked about it earlier. Consumers are looking for more solutions to help them feel better, and right. not just their body, but look, it's a high anxiety time also yeah. the mind, right? To find yeah. that calm, to find, yeah. you know, that focus and to be able to kind of, you know, find that sense of well-being. Um, so, yeah. you know, we're really excited about Thrive launching Whole Foods and Sprouts this month. And uh, it's an exciting, exciting launch for us. Fantastic. Yeah. You know, it occurred to me before that another silver lining of this maybe the, of, of quarantine is that pe people are, they're in, they're stuck in households with other family members that might have different um, diets and different attitudes about food and different habits or healthier habits. I know it, personally, my 21 year old daughter, who's a vegan, um, has been cooking for us lately, and it's kind of opened my mind to that. Um, <laughs> to you know, when 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 you said oat milk based, I, I thought, wow, you know, I'm I'm not sure pre COVID I would have been in a position to um, um, to try healthier things and to tr you know to think that deeply about it. Um, hey, it's super exciting. Rock, your taste buds might be, you know, might be surprised. You might really yeah. enjoy that. Yeah, a, exactly. Exactly. I promise. All good. Well, thanks, Chris. This, I, 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 Casey, I believe we're out of time, right? Yep. Okay. Yep. Thank you, Chris. That that was terrific. A awesome brand. Great company, and you you guys have a great energy and spirit about the brand and the opportunity and. Um, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to get some product right after this call and become, uh, become a member of the crew with a K. Perfect. Hey, thanks for having me. Thanks Casey for hosting. Uh, I learned a lot from the previous two uh, speakers. I thought that was a fantastic, fantastic session. I really enjoy, uh, the sharing going on. That's maybe the other silver lining of COVID era is that it seems like there's a lot more sharing, a lot more community in business across across the whole. And uh, I love the sharing. I love that you guys are helping promote and support that. So thank you. Yeah, no, thank you for being part of it. And and well said. I mean, it, definitely, it seems like um, community is something I think I was afraid we, we'd lose. Uh, and even like just our own company and not not being able to see each other in person every day. And it seems like, you know, we're, we're sharing funny gifts on Slack way more than ever before. And just like little things where, where it's like, it shows like people are really making an effort. Um, I think someone, someone said, uh, I think it was you, how, how resilient, uh, you know, pe people are and, and that, um, it, it's just amazing to see communities thriving like brand innovators. Uh, and, and another theme from today, just around optimism, it, it does feel like, you know, this is an optimistic group, it, you know, despite like uh, a lot of hardships and things changing faster than I can ever remember before, um, to just, uh, a, a lot of folks embracing the, the opportunity to, to learn and, uh, you know, fig figure out how we're going to evolve past this and hopefully be a lot better off uh, because of it. Um, so, so thank you. Thank you, Rob and Chris. Uh, new products uh, sound fantastic. So uh, e echo what Rob said. I'll be looking to, to try those out too. I'm a big oat milk fan. Um, and I yes. want to want to take a moment to thank all of our speakers from from the day. Uh, uh, Emily, especially for for being able to join without having having Wi-Fi. <laughs> 
Um, I, that, that's absolutely incredible to me, uh, in r- rolling with the punches there. Um, and, and yeah, Mark, Mark and John from, uh, our previous session, uh, and, and Chris and Rob, thank you guys. Thank you guys so much. Um, just want to remind everyone that, uh, please join us tomorrow at 2 PM Eastern time. Uh, there's a special live cast on uh, women on women in marketing. Uh, and we'll be joining from, uh, have leaders from electronics arts, electronic arts, CBRE, Neutralite and more. Um, so, so please tune in tomorrow. Uh, thanks everyone for joining and have a fantastic afternoon.